Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Marian Mansky, Director and Associate Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Dentistry in the Dental Hygiene Program as our speaker this evening. And she's right. here to discuss mastering the inferior alveolar nerve block. I hope I pronounced that well. <laughs> Before we get started, I would like to uh, thank you. <laughs> Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. Uh, continuing Education CE is available for this webinar this evening, and if you would like to participate in CE, please click on and uh, please click on and complete the survey that's going to pop up on your screen at the end of the presentation. And if you have a question, we invite you to also ask it in the Q&A section, and we will answer questions live at the end of the webinar. Ms. Mansky, welcome, and thank you so much for being with, here, with us here tonight. I will pass it over to you now. Hey, Shirley. Hello, everybody. Good to see all of you. I can't really see you, but I know you're there, so thanks for coming tonight. Uh, uh, the reason why I'm going to present this today is that this is the most unnerving injection, I could say, and it drives everybody crazy. Um, so I think that a lot of times when hygienists take the course, especially if they're taking a CE course it, and it's over a weekend, they go back to their practice and they're like, wait, how do I do that? And it becomes very frustrating. So having these refreshers and talking about it um, is helpful. So that's why I wanted to talk about specifically the inferior alveolar nerve block tonight. So welcome, everybody. I do have to disclose that I have received financial contributions from Henry Schein for this webinar. I'm an educator and a key opinion leader for Henry Schein, Septodont, and Accidental. And I've received honorariums from these companies when speaking about my experiences with their products and education. My bio, here it is. It's me. You don't need to read this, but just to know that I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, I've been a hygienist for about 40 years. Um, and I've been teaching local anesthesia for about Oh gosh, since 2006. Um, and I really do love teaching this. I love seeing that, you know, light bulb go on for the students and feel very comfortable with what they're doing. So um, this is a, a passion that I have of this particular topic. So again, I want you to understand the impact of that IA and B. The inferior alveolar nerve block is a very important injection, especially for us. Um, and I want you to try to uh, help you a little bit if you're having some concerns or, or, or want to know a little bit more about this. So we're gonna, the objectives are, you're gonna be able to identify the anatomical landmarks. It's key to doing this injection, um, locate the nerve, their structures, the bone elements involved, um, including the needle penetration site, and recognize that there can be some complications. Usually this is the one that there are complications and that's why anatomy is key for this injection. So let's begin. Um, of course, I have to have my little, my dog here. If you might hear her making some noises, I might have to move her, but she's okay so far. Um, this is this is Lucy, my golden. And uh, so, forty nine states. Congratulations to Texas, Georgia, North Carolina for finally getting local anesthesia passed. It's only one more state, Delaware, and we got to work on that. But all these states now allow hygienists to administer local anesthesia. And what do we hear a lot of the times is my hyg my hygienist is really great. She's awesome. He's awesome. They're awesome at numbing me. Um, it's very a, a very common comment. Uh, many dentists have their hygienists administer to all their patients in their practice. And why do you think that is? Typically, it's because of all the education that we've had. It is it is focused. It is um, specific to, to us. And it really, there's a lot of mentoring going on with this. We were all excited that all these states just got anesthesia. So it was a lot of support for each other and a very, very focused training. And we really, really value this. Um, and it's such a benefit for us not having to worry about stopping, getting the dentist to come over, the patient waiting, getting more anxious. So we really do value this. I mean, you got to remember that in some states, it just passed. Uh, and, but the first state was Washington State, 1971, I believe. So it's been around for a while and uh, almost all the states have it, which is, which is great. So again, the IA is the most difficult injection. It's baffling to many, many just avoid it and they'll do infiltrations, um, which, which is, you know, in some cases fine, but you really do need that, you know, especially for the uh, quadrant scaling, we need to have that IA block because we want 
both buccal, lingual, we want the teeth anesthetized, we want everything anesthetized instead of giving infiltrations. Um, but many do avoid it. It is a very powerful injection. It's great for us and you need to master it. So we're looking at the nerves here and here's our IA nerve. And you see that I've circled the IA, the, man, you know, the mandibular nerve, the mental nerve is there, the you know, inferior alveolar, the lingual, all these nerves are usually anesthetized with a real proper injection. So I, I call it the four in one injection the IA, the lingual, the mental, the incisive, and it is a true block for sure. Um, again, we need that IA and B more than sometimes a dentist. We need patient comfort or periodontal scaling. We want a large area anesthetized, both buccally and lingually, and that anatomy, again, is critical for our success. So here's that block, that yellow areas, all the areas that are going to get anesthetized with the block. That's why we, when we do the block, we do an IA, and then we do a long buckle to get the entire quadrant anesthetized. So the IA gets blocked. It's a branch of the posterior division of the mandibular nerve. So then the incisive, the mental, and commonly the lingual. Um, some people tell me, well, I give the injection, I'll give about half a cartridge, and then I'll leave, or, th or uh, three quarters, and I'll leave a quarter as I come out to get the lingual. Remember, and we'll talk about anatomy, you'll see how close that nerve is, lingual nerve is, to the IA. It, you don't really need to do that. You can get to the IA anatomical landmark, give that three quarters of a cartridge, and you will get both the uh, IA and the lingual and the incisive and the mental, so four and one. So it is called the IANB, inferior alveolar nerve block, but most commonly it's called the mandibular nerve block, and it's excellent for us. So if we're looking at this, and this is what I, I always tell my students, my colleagues when we're learning this, think about the anatomy. Visualize this anatomy because you have to, because if you don't, it doesn't work well. You've got to, you've got to visualize it. You've got to understand the anatomical landmarks are critical. And if you're looking at this left picture here and you see, you know, here's our IA uh, nerve. Here's the artery, here's the vein, here's the lingual nerve right here. You see that the lingual nerve is anterior to that IANB. That's why you're always gonna get the lingual. It's gonna diffuse always to that area. But that closeness of the vein and the artery, that's why this one is the most with positive aspirations. So we know that on the mandibular arch, infiltration is not as successful in the mandible as it does on the maxilla because that bone is more dense, the trabriculae is closer together, especially in the posterior teeth, and that's why blocks are preferable on the mandible. So we've got to get our mandibular teeth to the midline, anesthetized. That's the IANB and the incisive, the body of the mandible, the buccal mucoperiosteum mucous membrane anterior to the first molar, that's the mental nerve. The anterior two thirds of the tongue, floor of the mouth, that's the lingual and the lingual soft tissues and periosteum, that's the lingual nerve. So I wanna do a lot of teeth. I want to anesthetize a quad. I need buccal and lingual soft tissue um, anesthesia. Contraindications for this injection, if there's an infection or an inf uh, inflammation in the area that I'm gonna inject, uh, patients who might bite their lip or tongue, like a very young child or physically or mentally disabled patients usually aren't uh, candidates for the IA. And it's definitely not used bilaterally because the bilateral IA nerve block injections cause complete anesthesia of the entire body of the tongue, floor of the mouth, and the patient has difficulty in speaking and swallowing. The advantage is, of course, it's one injection for a very wide area. And I have to say that some of these pictures are myself, so you'll be seeing my, my mouth in these, in these pictures. Um, long story, but we uh, had a good time taking these pictures. So that's me right there. Um, the disadvantages is, that, again, wide area is not necessary for localized procedures. You can give an infiltration. You can use septicane to do that, and that or articane. That works well. Um, the rate of inadequate anesthesia, about 10 to 31 percent. And again, because everyone's anatomy is different, it's not reliable. You, know, you do your infiltrations on the maxilla, you do your mental, you know exactly where you're going, it's easy. You go to do the IA, it's not so easy because everybody's different. Um, again, sometimes it's problematic for certain individuals. There could be partial anesthesia possible if there's a bifid nerve and that positive aspiration can occur, as we said, 10 to 15% of the time, sometimes more than that. So let's talk about anatomy. Let's go back to anatomy, first year of dental hygiene, fall semester. 
And we're talking about the nerves involved in local anesthesia specifically. Well, we're just talking about one. It's tri the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve five. And the branches of that sensory root of five are the ophthalmic, which is the V1, maxillary V2, and mandibular V3. We're going to focus on the mandibular V3. As we're looking at this visual, you're seeing that the purples, uh, the mandibular zone, you see the trigeminal ganglion uh, really in the temporal area and um, how it splits, splits into three. That's why it's called the trigeminal nerve, um, that ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. The mandibular nerve though is the only one that's sensory and motor. Okay, so the, it, the sensory nerve travels downwards, exits the skull along with the motor root um, through the foramen ovale, and these two roots intermingle and enter together through the infratemporal fossa. So the sensory or afferent neur neurons are located in the trigeminal ganglia on the anterior surface of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. And at the end of the ganglia, as we said, it splits into three divisions. So the mandibular nerve has a very short main trunk. It's formed by the merger of a smaller anterior trunk and a larger posterior trunk in the infratemporal fossa. Um, the posterior trunk is what we're going to focus on, okay, because that's where the sensory nerve is. We're not going to be doing anything to motor nerves. We don't ever want to do anything to motor nerves, so we're, we're focusing on the posterior trunk. Okay, so that anterior trunk is formed by the merger of the buccal nerve and additional muscular nerve branches, where the posterior is formed by the merger of the following nerves, the auriculotemporal, the lingual, and the inferior alveolar. All right, just a visual here is your inferior alveolar nerve, the lingual nerve, the mental nerve. Now, the mylohyoid does branch off from the, from the IA, but that usually, in most cases, is motor, not sensory. However, we'll talk about it later that there could be a sensory component to it. This is just a visual that I created here just to make it kind of easier to understand how the mandibular nerve um, branches off. So directly branched off from the mandibular nerve is the buccal, branches of the muscles, auricular temporal, the lingual, the inferior alveolar, okay, right off, right off the mandibular nerve. Then off the inferior alveolar is the mylohyoid, the mental, and the incisive. So I'm circling, you see in yellow, and then the red and yellow again, that's what the inferior alveolar nerve block anesthetizes. So again, it's a sensory nerve from the mandibular teeth. Um, it's formed from the merger of the mental and incisive nerves. It travels posteriorly through the mandibular canal. And inside that canal, it innervates each tooth through the root apices, and it exits through the mandibular foramen. On the lingual surface of the ram ramus bordered by the lingula, as you see in that picture there, uh, number 135, 136 is the lingula, and 135 is the mandibular foramen. And this is where we're talking about when we talk about how we're holding our thumb on the coronoid notch, how we're looking at the pterygoid mandibular raphe. We're going three quarters from the distance of that notch to the posterior border of the ramus, just trying to find uh, that perfect spot where we're going to get the injection. So if we're looking again at the visuals here, you see the purple arrow, the relation of the IA to the coronoid notch. Uh, the posterior portion of the ramus, very important for this injection site. You have to, you can't just eyeball it. You've got to put your, you've got to put your thumb, you've got to put your finger on that notch. You've got to look at, you know, the horizontal line, the vertical intersection. Um, if you just kind of try to do it without that, you can run into some problems. So the key is depositing uh, near the IA just before it enters the mandibular foramen. So basically right at that lingula, right there is where we want to hit the bone, right there at uh, 20 to 25 millimeters with our needle. We know we're at the lingula, we back up, we aspirate, negative, we can, we're going to give the injection. So we want to be right near that lingula. So well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lingual nerve, the mental nerve, and the incisive because the IA is going to anesthetize these. Um, the lingual nerve is formed from afferent branches from the body of the tongue. It travels along the lateral surface of the tongue and it passes posteriorly from the medial to the lateral side of the submandibular salivary gland duct. It communicates with the submandibular ganglion. It's the sensation for the body of the tongue, floor of the mouth, lingual gingiva, mandibular teeth. Um, there is a portion of the parasympathetic system from the facial nerve, but it travels along with the lingual nerve too. At the base of the tongue, it ascends and runs between the medial pterygoid muscle and the mandible. It's anterior and slightly medial to the IA nerve, as you saw in that picture prior. 
So it is achieved through the IA block. There's no doubt about it for me. I'm hitting the IA uh, anatomical landmark. I'm giving that injection. I'm going to be giving uh, the, getting the lingual anesthetized too. Sometimes you find when you're giving this injection, only the lingual gets uh, anesthetized. And even though that anatomy is so close, you may be too anterior. So that's why hitting the bone at 20 to 25 millimeters is critical. So here we go again, look how close the lingual nerve is to that IA nerve. And again, what happens when you give the IA, the lingual nerve is gonna get anesthetized through diffusion of that anesthetic agent, no problem. The mental nerve. Now the mental nerve is soft tissue only, okay? It enters the mental foramen on the anterior lateral surface of the mandible. It's the external branches for the afferent nerve, so sensory for the chin, the lower lip, the labial mucosa, uh, the premolars and anterior teeth. So the mental nerve is just soft tissue, okay? But the incisive nerve, excuse me, this, this mental and incisive are so close together that when you give a mental injection, of course, you're gonna get both at the same time. That's why we get hard tissue and soft tissue anesthesia. Um, but the mental nerve just innervates soft tissue. Um, it anesthetizes the facial periodontia, the mandibular premolars. This is the anesthetic now. If, I, if I'm only giving an, a mental, I'm gonna get the premolars, the anterior teeth, the gingiva, the ligaments. Uh, it is part of the IA. Um, pulpal anesthesia is what the, it innervates, but it will anesthetize both because it's so close together to the incisive nerve. So here's our incisive nerve, the heart tissue only that it innervates. Okay, dental branches from the mandibular premolar, anterior teeth. It's a direct extension of that IA nerve and it innervates the pulpal and osseous tissues. So again, when you give something called a mental injection, you're gonna get both the hard tissue and soft tissue of the anterior part of the IA nerve anesthetized, meaning the incisive and the mental. Okay, so again, these are nerves that are part of the IA. You could see it right there in that visual. You see the IA nerve as it's branching off. You've got the mental and incisive branches. Um, and again, if you administer a mental, you're going to get both nerves anesthetized and you're going to get hard and soft tissue anesthesia. And buccal anesthesia, we are going to just talk a little bit about that because when we give an IA, as you saw in that visual that we began with, you saw the yellow was uh, all around except for the um, buccal area of the molars. So that's why when we come out from our IA, we get to do an easy injection called the long buccal that anesthetizes the buccal periodontium of the mandibular molars, the gingiva, the peritoneal ligament, the alveolar bone, very successful injection. The nerve is readily located. So you go from a very difficult to a very easy injection. So let's talk a little bit more about the administration of the IA uh, nerve block. So we gotta find landmarks, that's the, that's the key, okay? Um, actually, this is the landmark for the long buccal, but uh, we're gonna be talking about the IA in just a second. Um, so this, this is distal and buccal to the most posterior tooth in the quad. That needle is parallel to the occlusal plane. It's readily accessible and easy to do. But our block, that's the one that's difficult. That's the one that takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. If you're uncomfortable giving this injection, you'll look, look near you for a course that's a refresher course. It's very helpful. Or if you have a colleague that has been doing it for a while and is comfortable, ask for the help. Ask for you know, some practice with them just to feel more comfortable. Don't give up on this injection. This is the best injection. If you master this, you've got it all. Um, I, I say, if you got this one, you can do anything. Um, so we're, we want to anesthetize these pretty much the whole, almost entire quadrant, except that buccal area. And we're going to take a peek at what, you know, it looks like, you know, you've got to come contralaterally. This one is a little bit more anterior, but the jaw could be narrow. Uh, it depends really what the jaw looks like. You have a narrow jaw, you have a wide jaw, U-shape, V-shape. It makes a difference how that contralateral needle and uh, syringe is going to be placed. But you see that that needle's hitting right at the lingula area. That's where we want to go. So important landmarks, you've got to know them, the coronary notch and the pterygomandibular raphae. You have to know those, okay? The, um, so landmarks are the, the raphae, the notch, the occlusal plane of the mandibular teeth, uh, and that 20 to 25 uh, millimeter injection. It is the deepest injection you're going to give. All your other ones, maybe six, five, eight millimeters, but this is the deepest. And again, every person's different. So you need to find all three of these landmarks. So again, our injection site coming contralaterally. You see that the thumb on the left picture there is on the coronoid notch. 
you see that the um, needle is coming into the, probably right at the pterygo mandibular raphe, just about an anterior quarter, quarter away from it uh, laterally, and it's hitting contralaterally right at that lingula. And you see the picture on the right, um, you could see that pterygo mandibular space. You see the pterygo mandibular raphe right there, and you see the space right next to it. But you got to know that pushing all along that, that space is going to uh, go in. So where on that pterygo mandibular raphe, where do I give it? Okay. And that's the key. So the target area we want is the nerve as it travels on the medial aspect of the ramus before it goes into the mandibular foramen. Okay. Here it is. Same thing from a different view. You could see that I've made like a little target area. We've got our vertical and our horizontal. What does it mean? Let's talk a little bit more about what that means. That coronary notch is the deepest part of the ramus. You've got to get your thumb or your finger on it, depending where you are. If you're dominant side, I use my finger. If I'm non-dominant side, I'll use my thumb. There are three parameters we need to talk about. The height of injection, about six to 10 millimeters above the occlusal plane. The anterior posterior placement of the needle helps to locate that precise entry, entry point and that depth of penetration, which determines the location of the nerve. So that height of injection, we're gonna put our thumb or our finger of our non-dominant hand placed on the coronoid notch, and we're gonna palpate that coronoid notch. So I'm gonna take my little skull here and see if you all can see it. Um, let me know if you could not see it. So, so here's my skull, okay? So here is the coronoid notch right here, the deepest part of the ramus, okay? You can see it right there, right? Deepest part of the ramus. So we stick our thumb on that coronoid notch, okay? Um, we stretch the tissues laterally and taut, and then we imagine a, uh, a horizontal line running posterior from your finger, that thumb, to the deepest part of the pterygomandibular raphe. It will be a perfect horizontal straight line. Um, the deepest part of the uh, ramus, the coronary notch, and the deepest part of the pterygomandibular raphe line up perfectly in a horizontal line. No question about that. Um, and it's parallel to the occlusal plane, about six to 10 millimeters above that occlusal plane. So again, coronary notch, deepest part of the raphe, lines up in a perfect straight line. Now that horizontal, horizontal line, uh, imagine now that you've got the horizontal line and it intersects with a vertical line, three quarters of the distance from the notch and about a quarter from the raphe. So if I hold up my jaw again, which might or might not help you depending on what I see here, um, again, this is going to hmm, line up perfectly with the pterygo mandibular raphe in a straight line. And then when you're coming in with your needle, what I do is I'll, I'll, I'll typically do it and do my anatomical landmarking as I'm putting the topical on. I kind of use that as my needle. So I kind of make those lines myself with my thumb on the notch, making that straight line from the notch to the raphe going a quarter from the raffe and in and making sure I'm six to 10 millimeters above the occlusal plane. So do that with your topical. That, that's a time to be thinking about that and finding it. And even when you're getting ready to use, you know, the injection, if you got your needle there, I do the, the same thing again. Um, so that repetitiveness kind of gets it in your brain how, it, how, how it's supposed to be and makes you more comfortable. So many patients, that height of injection is about six to 10 millimeters of the occlusal plane. If you're using the teeth as, you know, as a guide and you're leaning against it, you're too low. So that syringe should be in the commissure on the contralateral side. The perfect spot, the perfect anatomy is the mandibular second premolar. Might not end up up there, but that's where we always start. So that long needle is inserted into the pterygomandibular space until it contacts bone. About 20 to 25 millimeters, three quarters of that needle should be uh, embedded in, in tissue. Okay, if, you, if you're only quarter in, if you're only halfway in, you're not far enough. So we use a 25 or 27 long gauge needle. Again, the coronary notch, the pterygomandibular raphe, that deepest recess of the raphe, and the occlusal plane of the mandibular posterior teeth. You prepare your tissue, you orient the needle, uh, the bevel toward bone, you don't think bevels are important, they are important. And if we're thinking about the bevel, I don't know if you can see this, this is just a high speed suction tip. That's all this is. That's like a bevel, okay? We want it pointed toward bone. If we're giving a right, if I'm a right-handed operator and I want to give a, a right side IA, that where is that bevel gonna point? It's gonna point toward me, 
Is it away from you? That's what I always say to the students. Is it away from me or toward me? It's going to be toward me because that I'm going to hit that bone on the um, medial side of the jaw, and I want that bevel pointing that way. It's important. You want that um, solution to flow the way you want it on that bone. Um, so the patient's always back, always back. I always put my patient supine. Why? It make, it's easier for me to see. They, can, they open really wide. I can see better. And if anything ever happens with an emergency situation, I've already got them in the right position. So locate your site. Absolutely use epinephrine. Epinephrine is your friend, as I say. Um, it, it helps with systemic toxicity. It leaves the drug in the area longer. Um, it definitely uh, helps a lot with our uh, anesthesia. Uh, really, the only patients that can't use anesthesia, uh, epinephrine are usually patients who are allergic to um, sulfite, who have sulfite allergies, because the preservative or antioxidant in the cartridge is um, meti uh, sodium metabisulfite, and if patients are allergic to sulfites, that's problematic. Uh, usually, on other patients, we use a you know uh, cardiac dose, uh, a, a dose enough, you know, two cartridges of lidocaine with epinephrine, and, and, and it ends up being no problem. I, I really do, do like using epinephrine. I rarely use uh, plain uh, mepivacaine. So we're putting our thumb or pointer finger on that corner notch, we're place, uh, placing the syringe barrel contralaterally at the second premolar. If you're a right-handed operator, you're going to be uh, at eight o'clock facing the patient. Uh, if you're a right-hand operator doing the left IA, you're going to be uh, sitting at 10 o'clock facing the same direction of the patient. Okay, and there, you know, there is what it's going to look like. You only see about a quarter of the needle sticking out. You see that little... Uh, dipping in of that pterygomandibular uh, fossa or space. Again, understand that all along that raffe, that space can push in. So you have to be precise of where you're putting it in. Say 20 to 25 millimeters, three quarters of that long needle is in tissue. Um, you see the red dot on that needle, that is a bevel indicator. If you hate looking at the bevel and it's hard for you to see, you can always order them as bevel indicators with a little dot on it. And again, here's the visual, okay? Anterior, posterior position is key. You may start at the second premolar, but you might have to move anteriorly. You might have to move posteriorly. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So anterior, posterior position, hitting bone at 20, 20, 25 millimeters precludes any chance of entering the parotid. If you look at that picture there, you'll see the parotid is further behind. Um, and if you don't hit bone, that's a possibility of uh, hitting the area where the parotid is and what surrounds the parotid, your facial nerve. And that pretty much would facial nerve paralysis and anesthetize from the scalp all the way to the chin. So again, this is what I'm visualizing. And it's important that, you know, we use those landmarks for anatomy, thinking about what we're hitting, where we're going. You know, we don't want to go too far back. We don't want to go too close. We want to hit that at 20, 25 millimeters, knowing that we're hitting that in, in that lingula area. So when the bone is contacted, you're going to withdraw the needle a millimeter. You don't want to inject on bone. You want to protect the periosteum, preventing any subperiosteal injection. I aspirate twice. I, I aspirate once. I turn it a little bit. I aspirate again. Why? Because sometimes the vessel, the blood, uh, blood vessel can collapse. You think you're not in a negative. You think you've got a negative, but you might be in a positive. So I always do two negative aspirations. If it's negative, we slowly deposit about 1.5 millimeters of anesthetic over 60 seconds. It should take one minute for the full cartridge to be um, you know, deposited, one minute. Don't go too fast, that hurts the patient. So almost the whole cartridge is deposited here. I leave about a quarter cartridge um, for the uh, long buckle. Same way you went in is the same way you went out. So slowly withdraw the needle, make it safe, meaning cap it. And when we cap it, we never do a two-fisted cap, right? We can use these cards. Um, I have these protector cards at our school. You see these here, somewhat, sorry. Um, these are great to have. And sometimes the cassettes come with uh, a place to put the needle too, but never do two-fisted two capping, as you know. Um, and after about 20 seconds, I put the patient in a semi-upright position. Why? I want gravity to take effect. I gave the injection over here. I want that solution to flow down to the midline of the uh, quadrant. So I put the patient in a semi-upright position, wait about three to five minutes, and always, always stay with your patient. Why? Because overdose symptoms start within the first five minutes in most cases. 
let's talk a little bit about giving our IA block. Um, there are some failure rates, as we know, and, and uh, Kathy Bassett talks in an article that the failure rate is about 10 to 31 percent, where Khalil says 20 to 25 percent. Why is it? It's usually one of two things, poor operator technique or anatomical variability. So let's say that you've given the block and the success is lip and tongue numbness, right? In three to five minutes, you're asking the patient, how does it feel over here? How's your tongue? Um, there are concerns about it, if the bone was contacted too soon, uh, the needle's too far on anterior on the ramus, or the bone's not contacted at all, it's too far posterior. So we troubleshoot. Uh, we bone, the bone is contacted too soon. What do you do? Well, you don't give the injection because you're too anterior. You need to be more posterior. So with, withdraw the needle slightly. Don't take it out. You're in the right place. You found your spot. Um, you just need to withdraw it slightly bring your barrel toward the front of the mouth over the canine instead of the premolar. And that needle tip will now be located posteriorly for proper injection. That's why when we talk about anterior posterior positioning, what are we doing there? So how about if bone is not contacted? You wanna withdraw the needle slightly. Um, you wanna bring that syringe barrel now closer to the molars because as you bring the barrel posteriorly toward the molars, the needle tip is gonna move more anteriorly for proper injection. And it, it doesn't always say that it has to be the molar. It could be the distal of that second premolar. It could be the first premolar if we're doing anterior, trying to get it more posteriorly. So you just have to kind of work with it a little bit and don't be afraid to do so. Um, we do it all the time. Nobody, you know, nobody has the proper, perfect anatomical landmarking. We do get them. It's great to have them every now and again, but it doesn't always happen. So how about if there's an accessory nerve or a bifid nerve? That can be problematic. Um, the mylohyoid, as I said before, sometimes has sensory innervation to the first molar. So you're giving your IA uh, injection. Everything's numb, but that first molar is not numb. Well, there's probably an accessory nerve. Um, so if that's the case, it's not going to numb because the mylohyoid is the one who's having the sensory innervation. So you could give a Galgates injection, or you can do a buccal infiltration on the, on the uh, first molar. And that's a Galgates. It's a high injection. The great thing about a Galgates is it does it all. It does the IA and the long buckle in one injection. So I, I do like that injection. Um, how about if there's a bifid nerve? You can see in the in the pano picture there that and the and the picture to the right that the nerve splits into two. You're never going to know that for sure. You may have a, a panorexic patient. You may be able to see it. Um, if that's the case, maybe the whole you know the IA won't work. Maybe just portions of it got anesthetized. So you'll have to infiltrate that area. Okay, there is a video here, but I'm sure that I can't play it. So I'm going to just maybe uh, send it off as an email to, to all of you maybe afterwards if we can do that. It's just really just a, I, I call it the um, field trip to the IA nerve. It really is, a, it's, it's on YouTube, it's a good visual. So concerns with this injection and, and why, why do people avoid it? Sometimes they get worried if something happens and, you know, well, I'm just not going to ever give it again. Well, you know, we need to be concerned about anything happening with any injection we give. So let's talk about some concerns. The first one is needle breakage. You can see this is from Alamed's book. You can see that needle right there, uh, the red arrow, and you can see that it's bent. Um, we never, we never bend needles. There's no reason to bend a needle. So please don't ever bend one. If you think about a paper clip and you, you bend it and after a while it's, it's going to break, it's going to weaken that needle, um, that paper clip, same thing with the needle. You bend it, it's going to weaken it. So it's pretty rare that needle breakage does happen. It's usually because the operator is using the wrong length or gauge. Um, show there's strong evidence of bending the needle before its insertion, again, we don't do that, or if it's inserted the entire length to the hub. So you never want to insert the entire length of the needle to the hub. Um, that is dangerous. That's the uh, weakest part of the needle taking the most strength. So that, that bending of the needle or the wrong size, the wrong length, so, uh, a sudden unexpected movement as the needle penetrates the muscle or contacts the periosteum. Lots of times that could happen with children. Um, and if smaller gauge needles are used, they're more likely to break. Defective needles, that's very, very rare. Um, that's why I always say a 25 or 27, there's no reason to use a 30 gauge needle for an inferior alveolar nerve block, in my opinion. So if we're looking at the needle gauge, you know, what does the gauge refer to? It refers to the diameter of the lumen or the opening of the needle. The higher the gauge number, the smaller the diameter of the lumen. 
So 25 gauge has the largest opening. It's the most rigid. The 27 gauge is a little bit less opening. And that 30 gauge is the, is the least rigid with the smallest opening. And I put an X there that because I just, I never would use it. In, in, in my practice, I don't use it. Um, so I, I put the asterisks on the 25 and the 27. And you could see that bevel, the shaft, the hub, you see where the hub is. Again, you're going in with that needle. It's going in, going in, going in, and you're going past that. You see about a quarter of it sticking out. If you're going past it, you're headed for the wrong place anyway with the IA, and you're also headed for trouble because you're going too close to the hub. So again, the more rigid the needle, the less deflection of the needle. It's going to go toward the target better. It's going to be more rigid. It's going to sustain. It has better strength. And then, of course, you, you've seen this, of course, the, the color-coded gauges. We've got our blue, which are 30, our yellow, 27, and red is 25. Again, blue is the least rigid needle. It's very, very thin, a very small opening. Yellow is about mid-size, and then the red is the most rigid. The length of the needle is important, too. Remember that a short needle is only 25 millimeters. Okay, you have to go 20 to 25 millimeters with this injection. If you're using a short needle, you may be injecting to the hub and you need to be careful and you're using a needle, um, the shorts, like the 30 shorts is that least rigid needle. Um, of course, there's a, there are 27 shorts also, but again, it's only 25 millimeters. Where you're long is 32 millimeters. You got a lot of room and a lot of, lot of needle to work with there. And the choice is depending on what we're doing, where we're going. And shorts for me is infiltration and long is for my IA uh, mandibular block. The length of that needle is measured from the hub to the tip and the needle should never be inserted to the hubs, as I said before. So you wanna be six millimeters before the hub. That's about a quarter of the needle sticking out. Okay, so larger gauge needles is prevention for uh, needle breakage, larger gauge needles for techniques requiring significant depths or IA. Long needles to assure we're not inserting to the hub. Don't redirect a needle once it's inserted to tissues. You've got to go this one way. We say it's a one-way street. We're going straight. We're not making any turns, okay? If we have to make turns, we need to come out and readjust ourselves. That's why I say withdraw almost completely before redirecting if you have to. Not, not all the way out. You're probably in the right place, but redirect it by coming almost completely out. So if you do this, if you direct it, you know, in the deep tissues, you've got some force pushing on that needle from muscles and you don't want that to happen because that could be uh, breaking it. Again, don't insert to the hub. As I said, it's the least flexible part of the needle and the weakest part of the needle. So what if this happens, okay? Remain perfectly calm, okay? You gotta instruct that patient not to move. A lot of times we'll say, put your hand in the patient's mouth to keep them open. If it's visible, Go ahead, take a hemostat or forceps and take it out. But if it's not visible, don't attempt to get it out. Don't dig for it. Don't, you can end up pushing it further in. You're going to note the incident on the chart and refer to an oral surgeon. Persistent anesthesia, paresthesia. Now, these are things that can happen with an IA. Typically an IA or um, um, a posterior superior alveolar or nerve block could happen. Most of the times it's with an IA. This is anesthesia, of course, that lasts for days, weeks, or months. Patient feels numb still, swollen, tingling, itching. Their tongue feels weird. They can't talk right. They can't taste right. Um, it's usually a trauma to a nerve uh, or injection of a local solution contaminated by alcohol or sterilizing solution near a nerve. So that's why I never, I only have them in their canisters or in their uh, bubble pack. I never put them in the drawer. I keep them in their container that I got it in. Um, there's trauma to the nerve sheath. That's like a, a, sometimes an electric shock feeling. Um, inserting into foramen, which we, we never insert into foramen, or hemorrhage, me meaning that the bleeding in increased the pressure on the nerve. I, I always explain it like a garden hose. You step on a garden hose, nothing's coming out. Same thing with hemorrhage. If it's bleeding around that nerve and it's squeezing it, the patient can have the feeling of paresthesia. Sometimes the solution itself, there are some studies that find an increase in a 4% solution over a 2 or 3% solution, um, prilocaine, articaine, um, I have my doubts about that, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, I, I don't really see that 4% uh, solution, in my experience, has made any difference at all. Um, prevention management of this, you got to adhere to injection protocol. you got to have proper care and handling of those dental cartridges. If it does happen, how do we manage this? Well, most resolve within eight weeks. 
You want to reassure the patient. You want to speak to them directly. And you want to explain it's not uncommon. It could happen in the best circumstances. I, ha I had it happen at school one time to one of my students. Best circumstances, great injection, perfect, on target. Next day, paresthesia. It can happen. Remember, we don't have that x-ray vision. We can't see where everything is. Um, so what if it happens? What do you do? You want that patient coming into the office. You want to examine them. You want to record the incident. And what I always call it, map mapping of the paresthesia. So map it, meaning where, what's the degree, what's the extent. You want to write that in the chart and you want to see them um, about every eight weeks. You want them to come in and take a look and see what's going on. It could last up to six months. It usually is eight weeks, but it could be six months to a year. Um, and time is the recommended medicine, it needs to heal. Uh, you want to reschedule again every two months. If at one year, nothing's happening, consult with an oral surgeon or neurologist. And of course, I wouldn't re-administer in that area if this has happened. I've used an alternate technique. Facial nerve paralysis, as we talked about before with that picture of the parotid gland. Uh, basically, the facial nerve uh, is the seventh cranial nerve, and it carries motor impulses to the muscles of facial expression, scalp, external ear from head to chin, scalp to chin. And paralysis, meaning an IA block was administered in the capsule of the parotid gland. So we take a look here. You see that on you know the right, the left side, my left side of the picture, patients you know squinching, no problem. But I, on the right side, the patient's pretty much paralyzed, can't move. Okay, here's me. Look, happened to me too. Happened to a colleague who's a dentist. I said, "Can I have your picture?" She's like, "Yeah, take it." And then I had my friend take my picture at school. I'm like, "Take my picture. I have facial nerve paralysis." Basically, what happens is the uh, local anesthetic goes into the capsule of the parotid gland. The needle is too posterior for the IA. You, you may place it in the body of the parotid and the result is, is paralysis. Taking a look at that visual, you see that that whole facial nerve is surrounding that parotid gland. And if you don't hit bone, you could be headed that way. So how the problem, how long does it last? It lasts as long as the anesthesia. The patient's gonna have unilateral paralysis as I did. It was a weird feeling. I knew what happened to me. And I'm, you know, the dental professional, I knew it would happen, but it was a very strange feeling. I was very uncomfortable. Um, just imagine what your patient would feel like. They don't know anything that's happening to them. So you want to adhere to protocol with the blocks. You've got to hit bone. You got to hit bone. It precludes any possibility that local anesthetic will be injected into the parotid gland. Reassure the patient if they have contacts, they should be removed. Uh, they want to put an eye patch on the affected eye because the patient can't blink record the incident and usually they don't for uh they forego further treatment at that appointment. Um, when it happened to me, uh, I knew it was happening. I got the injection, my eyes started tearing, and of course the area that was supposed to be numb wasn't numb. Um, and I knew it right away. And again, it was a very uncomfortable feeling. Um, if it, you know, that's why, we, that's why we do this. That's why we inject each other. That's why we talk about this stuff. We want to have empathy for our patients to, to let them understand it. I basically went to my office, really couldn't do anything back to my office. I had to lay down and just wait until it, it, it um, went away in about two hours. Trismus. What is trismus? Restricted jaw movement. Okay. Why? Trauma to the muscles or blood vessels in the infratemporal fossa. Um, again, solutions which alcohol or cold sterilizing solutions have diffused. Uh, hemorrhage, that large volume extravascular blood can produce irritation, can't open too much blood in the area, and uh, sometimes you can get an infection afterwards. How do I prevent trismus? Sometimes trismus is not always preventable, especially with patients with TMD. They, they can have trismus, um, but using sharp, sterile, disposable needles, properly handled cartridges, meaning that needle tip is sterile, okay? It goes from this sheath to tissue. It doesn't touch the patient's bib. It doesn't touch, you know, the, the tray cover. The minute that touches it, it's not sterilized. It's not sterile anymore. And you could cause an infection to the patient. So properly handle cartridges using your aseptic technique, atraumatic insertion, uh, no repeating injections, multiple insertions in the same area. Um, and that's why using blocks instead of infiltrations wherever possible, uh, minimum volume of anesthetic, uh, it should be used. So the patient calls says, I ha can't open my mouth, you know, a day after having a PSA or an IA block, because that's usually where trismus occurs. You want to arrange an appointment. You want to prescribe heat therapy, warm saline rinses, analgesics. The dentist can uh, provide muscle relaxers if necessary. 
So what is heat therapy? It's hot, moist towels to the affected area, 20 minutes every hour, water, warm saline rinses, about a teaspoon of salt and a 12 ounce glass of water held in the mouth on the affected side and then expectorated. Aspirin is used as an analgesic. Codeine may be needed 30 to 60 milligrams, diazepam at times for 10 milligrams twice a day for muscle relaxation. Physiotherapy is really good for this opening and closing the mouth as well as lateral excursion, five minutes every three to four hours. Believe it or not, chewing gum really helps because that, that provides that lateral movement of that TMJ. You want to record the findings in the chart, avoid any further treatment until it's resolved. It usually improves about 48 to 72 hours. When do I have to refer this? Well, the pain goes beyond 48 hours. There's possibly an infection. The dentist may prescribe antibiotics. Severe pain dysfunction after two to three days or five to seven days of antibiotics, and they may refer to an oral surgeon. Hematoma, what is it? We know what hematoma is, a fusion of blood into extravascular spaces, nicking of a blood vessel, artery, or vein during an injection. What can happen? It, it increased rapidly in size for an artery, greater blood pressure in, that, in the artery, of course, than the vein. Um, tissue density surrounding the vessel is a determining factor. What can happen, bruising, bruising and trismus, inconvenience to the patient or embarrassed that this happened to our patient. So how do I manage this? Um, well, basically you put direct pressure on that site of bleeding and the IA, the pressure would be applied to the medial aspect of the ramus and the long buff or palatal place pressure at the site of bleeding. Um, that pressure is applied uh, to the mucobuccal fold is distally to be tolerated, that's for our PSA. And ice, of course, is the next thing to do. So pressure first, then ice uh, to increase pressure on that site and constrict the vessel. So you discharge once the bleeding stops, document the chart. We're talking about a large hematoma. Now, I want to say that pretty much every time I've given a pallet, it bleeds. Every time I've given a long buckle, it bleeds. I'm not going to dismiss the patient. I'm going to use my pressure with the gauze to stop the bleeding. We're talking about a large hematoma happening here. Um, if they're sore, you're going to advise them to take an analgesic. They shouldn't use any heat for at least four to six hours. I usually say um, 24 hours. Um, I usually use ice that first day and about seven to 14 days it's going to take to get better. Um, just a little question about drugs and your inferior alveolar nerve block. Um, just something that I've over the years come up with. If you want to put in the chat or the Q&A about this, I'd like to know what you use for your inferior alveolar nerve block. Do you use articane? Do you use lidocaine? use one or the other, does it matter to you? Um, you know, in some, some places, practices, they only use lidocaine. In some schools, they only use lidocaine. In some other schools, they use both. Um, what do you use and why? And your lidocaine, of course, is the gold standard. It's been around since 1948. We've used it. We know how it works. It's our gold standard. Um, articane does have advantages. Just wanted to let you know about that. 90 to 95% of this is metabolized in the plasma. We know that lidocaine is metabolized in the, um, in the liver, right? But the uh, most of the articane is metabolized in the plasma before it reaches the liver. It's like an ester. So there's less concern with patients who have liver concerns. If patients have liver disease, you may want to use this. There is presence of a sulfur ring in, in uh, a sulfur atom in the ring, increases lipophilic properties, results in fast reliable infiltration. That's why on my maxillaries, I rarely give a palatal injection. I, I just don't. I use septicane on my uh, PSA, MSA, ASA, and pretty much about 90, 95% of my patients, they are anesthetized in the palate also. So it diffuses very nicely through bone. Um, it does have a very short half-life. Uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, remember that there's six half-lives have to happen before it's completely out of the body, 5.5, uh, almost six. So for nursing mothers, that's that's an appeal um, to, to get it out of the body uh, quicker. So 5.5 half-lives for a drug to be considered cleared. So 2.5 hours, it's gone. For lidocaine, their half-life is 1.6. So that's times 5.5. It's going to take about 8.8 .8 hours for all the lidocaine to be out of the body. So there's just some advantages with this drug. And I think it's a pretty powerful drug. I do like both of them. I use articane or lidocaine. That's my go-to all the time. Um, disadvantages, here we are with the 4% solution. Uh, there's controversy that remains among regarding paresthesia. Um, I, you know, I've done some looking and research for this. I really can't find the difference. Uh, I, Malamed has written some great articles about this. Uh, usually it's operator error with the paresthesia rather than the solution. Um, 
is only available, both lidocaine and articaine are only available with epinephrine. There is plain lidocaine, but now that comes in vials. It doesn't come in cartridges anymore. Um, sulfite allergies, any local anesthetic with epinephrine, as I said, um, the sulfite, the preservative found um, in, in our cartridge, antioxidant, um, that is going to be in any cartridge with, with that we're using epinephrine. It's a, it's a, a preservative for the epi. So if you have a patient that has this allergy, you would just use them with pivacaine. Um, there's no sulfa issues with this drug at all. And the great thing about these is they're both available in one to 100,000 and one to 200,000. So if you're worried about using epinephrine on your patient who has hypertension, controlled hypertension, or maybe just a little elevated, you want to use a one to 200,000. You've got less epinephrine in that drug, which is really pretty helpful. So that's my little take on that. Um, the reliability of injections, it depends again on the anatomy of the patient. You have to adhere to, to the um, anatomical landmarking. You have to go through it with every single patient because they're all different. They feel different. Males are different than females. Uh, we always try, you know, try it in school. Like when we're in school, we'd have one look at another, one look at another. They're all different. That's why we rely heavily on visualization, palpation of the heart tissues to find those injection sites. Um, you want to consider blood vessel, glandular tissue. Uh, you don't want to inject in that area. That's why I never give uh, and floor of the mouth injections. Um, but the IA is a powerful injection. Again, you master it, you've mastered it all. Uh, it's a great injection. If you have any concerns, you want some information, please feel free to contact me. I, I'm, I'm available for discussion. Um, and look for courses, look for refreshers. So if you have any questions, I, I want, I'm hoping to see them. Um, and I just want to show you that this is the QR code for your CEs. So make sure you all take a picture of that so you can get your C credits. And if there are any questions, I'm open to answering those questions. So Shirley, any questions come on? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a question from Linda. Thank you. Yes, cartridges now contain 1.7, not 1.8. That is true. Technically, though, it's 1.76. So it's 1.76, something like that. It's averaged up to 1.8, but yes, they all say 1.7 now. But when you average it, when you look at the actual amount in that cartridge, it's a little over 1.7. That's why in my mind, they always say 1.8. Um, is lidocaine the best for children? Amanda, thanks for asking that question. Um, lidocaine can be used with children. Uh, remember that when you're in school, they would talk about um, uh a, you know, A category drug, B category drug, C categories. They don't do that anymore. They stopped doing that in 2014. And they're looking at the drug of risk versus benefit. So you've got to look at it. What's the best drug to use for that child? Um, you know, what are you looking for the drug to do? The lidocaine is the gold standard. You can use lidocaine. You can use mepivacaine. Um, septicaine, it's it's a bit powerful. Um, and if you ever get an infiltration with septicaine, a lot more gets infiltrated than just one tooth. So that that could be concerning. So I'd probably stick with lidocaine or mepivacaine. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so if a patient's allergic to sulfur, can we use lido with epi? Okay, remember back on the slide. Okay, it's not sulfa, it's sulfite. Metabisulfite is the concern. Patients who are allergic to sulfites are usually allergic, they can't have red wine or white wine. It's not sulfa. So that a lot of people got confused about that. It's nothing to do with sulfa, it's sulfite. So no problem using articaine, lidocaine, don't worry about it. Okay, any other questions? Let me just look, oh. Um, can a hygienist give intrapapillary injections? Uh, you mean papillary injections? Sure, we can give papillary injections. It really depends what state you live in, but I don't think there's any problems with an intrapapillary injection. Um, I often get an electric shock with, shock with the IA. What's the solution? Okay, if you're getting electric shock, it means that you got to really work on your anatomical landmarking. Um, again, use the landmarks. It should help you. Sometimes we can't avoid it. It does happen. I have to say that it does happen. Um, Shirley, you want me to keep going? Can I keep going? Yeah, that would be great. Yep, absolutely. Okay. If you are right-handed operated, did you say use your finger on the right IA and thumb on the left? Yes. Okay, so think about it. When you're sitting in the chair and you want to use your thumb on your right-handed operator, you want to use your thumb on the right side, you get all squishy and weird. So I use my finger and I and for the left, I come around the patient's head and I'll use uh, my thumb. 
So yes. And that's all the questions I have at this point, which is great. Thank you for the questions. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation, for answering the questions. And additionally, uh, we put a link in the chat um, right above. So please take a moment to complete that, fo that form to become eligible for continuing education credits. And that link is there. And thank you again, uh, Ms. Mansky, for a wonderful presentation. And we did record tonight's webinar and we'll email the recording out sometime in the next week. We would appreciate your feedback via survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. And we look forward to seeing you at the future webinars. Mm -hmm.